Formula One has a rich history and an exciting future. Pat Simmons is part of both. When I go back and I look at, let's say, a 1980 one car that I, I worked on and was very proud of at the time. I look at it now and I think, wow, yeah, <laughs> surely a dinosaur drove this. I have this this thirst for knowledge. That's the sort of thing that keeps me going, is uh, really these new technologies that we have to embrace. Pat's past is in racing. He won world titles with Michael Schumacher and Fernando Alonso, and he worked with Ayrton Senna at the start of the Brazilian's F1 career. He was very strong-minded, and when we said, look, you know, you can go faster if you were a bit fitter, because of his sort of strong, almost pig-headedness, you know, he wouldn't accept things like that. But that same quality, when it came to anything else, really drove him. Today, as F1's chief technical officer, Pat's overseeing the current rules on car design, and he's looking to the future, to the sweeping changes coming in 2026, when the sport will introduce a game-changing sustainable fuel and an all-new generation of car. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Pat Simmons has been in F1 for nearly five decades, always racing with the very best. In the 1980s, he was at the Tolman team when a rookie called Ayrton Senna sensationally scored a Monaco podium. In the 90s, he was Michael Schumacher's race engineer at Benetton and he worked on the cars which gave Schumi his first couple of world titles. Another decade, another champion. This time, Fernando Alonso in 2005 and 6. Pat was an integral part of their successes, and many people in his position would be happy to sit back and bask in their former glories. But not Pat. He's still looking forwards to new innovations and new technologies, like the revolutionary sustainable fuel which will power F1 in 2026. With the FIA and F1 teams, he's also helping to shape the 2026 cars, determined to ensure that F1 continues to be spectacular. Pat and I met up at the start of this season for a conversation about all this and more, including the chances he had to work at Ferrari. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Pat, it's great to have you on the show. How are you? Very well. Enjoying life. Well, after 40 years, more than 40 years in Formula One. Some years ago, I, I sort of left the competitive side of it and jumped over the fence more onto the regulatory side. So I, I miss the competition sometimes and that excitement of, you know, how are you going to do this year? But then, you know, I, I love the work that we're doing and seeing how that develops into producing what I think is an absolutely great racing series. Well, look, why don't we talk about the regs right now? At the moment, you're Chief Technical Officer of Formula One. You're one of the driving forces behind these ground effect regulations. Did you think we'd still be seeing as much revolution, I think if that's the right word, in year three of the regs as we are now? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, it's an interesting question because, of course, when we first started talking about the regulations, and you may remember, Tom, we, we uh, showed the car in, in the USA in 2020 when we were planning to introduce in 21 before COVID sort of delayed everything. And one of the things we did there is we showed images of a lot of different interpretations of the, the cars because a lot of people were saying, oh, well, you know, you, you, you're so prescriptive in the regulations now. There's no room to develop. And I knew that wasn't the case, which is why we did that. I was pleased when we first saw the cars in 22, there were a lot of different solutions. But, you know, to any engineering problem, there is only one solution. Now, luckily, we never get there. We iterate towards it, and we're seeing that iteration in certain areas. You know, the downwash side pods are becoming um, the way to do things. But when you look at something like this year's Red Bull, interesting intakes into the side pods, intakes uh, above the sort of the, the headrest area, lo lots of things that, yeah, I can't say I anticipated exactly that that was the way it was going. But uh, I am very pleased to see that there's still changes. And I know from speaking to Adrian Newey that it's not over yet. There's plenty more to come. 
<laughs> yeah, did you factor in Adrian when you were thinking of the ranks? You cannot factor in Adrian. <laughs> what about the closeness of the racing that we've seen over the last two years? Were you surprised that one team stole a march in the way that they did? One driver did. Uh, and that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because we set certain objectives when we, we did the 22 car. One of them was for the cars to be able to follow each other closely. And we certainly achieved that. Uh, we achieved it actually probably better than I ever expected we would do. We had another objective where we wanted to close the grid up. Now, historically, there'd been a sort of 3% difference in, in lap time between pole position and 20th on the grid. And it'd been like that for years. And in 2022, it remained like that. And I was a little bit disappointed by that. And I couldn't really understand why, because I'd done a number of things on that car to try and help the smaller teams. You know, having designed these cars or run design teams for many years, I knew the areas that were difficult. I knew the areas where if you had a big team, an experienced team, you could throw your effort in there. And I tried to eliminate that so that it, it leveled the playing field a little bit. But we didn't achieve it in uh, 22. But in 23, we did. We hit the one and a half percent. You know, we regularly saw seven different types of car in the top 10. We even saw eight at, at one race. Now, that's the sort of thing we hadn't seen for a long, long while because we had the sort of Noah's Ark of racing, you know, two by two by two of the the different makes and so we had achieved a, a lot of those sort of things of course as the guys developed the car some of our objectives were damaged they certainly weren't destroyed they were damaged so the 23 cars were a little bit more difficult to follow than the 22 cars but massively better than 21 cars still you talk about the competitive side of you quite wishes you were still on a team having to deal with this but also it's an engineering exercise for you, even what you've said so far on the pod. What is it for you? Is it a passion for racing? Is it an engineering exercise? Is it a mixture of everything? What's, what's kept you in the sport for so long? To be honest, it's probably more the passion for engineering. Uh, I do have a passion for racing, of course, you know, and that goes back to um, pre-teen years. You know, I loved, loved racing as a kid. And what I also love is I love the sort of the intellectual challenge of engineering and i came into formula one at a time when the intellectual challenge was really beginning you know for, we'd moved from the era of the incredibly clever but sometimes sort of seat of the pants engineers into the time when you needed to be a, a little bit of an academic and i was one of those early sort of academic engineers if you like so that passion for engineering is actually I think at the, the front of it and even that is competitive you know can I do a better job than someone else how much of your engineering knowledge of racing cars was taught to you in a classroom and and how much on the job at the racetrack <laughs> well I think you need to have the grounding uh, in a classroom there's no doubt about it so I studied mechanical engineering first and then at Cranfield I studied automotive engineering there was no such thing as motorsport engineering, which, of course, a lot of universities are doing now. So I did my master's in, in automotive engineering, but my, my specialization was vehicle dynamics, vehicle handling and stuff like that. And certainly that formed the basis of uh, a lot of the work I did later. But what you really learn is, is the inquiring mind. It's embracing new technologies that came along. Now, you know, it's hard for your younger listeners perhaps to even understand that I started in Formula One at a time when we didn't have laptops, we didn't have access to computers, we didn't have CFD, uh, things like that. And we didn't have electronics on the cars. So all these sort of things I've had to teach myself. And uh, I enjoy that, that side of it. I enjoy learning. I perhaps somewhat facetiously sometimes when people ask me what my hobbies are I say knowledge acquisition because that's what I love doing going down that rabbit hole of exploring a subject it's, well, it's fascinating but while data obviously gives you so much more insight can you get lost in data yeah very much so and when you talk about data in, in the context of, of racing cars it's quite interesting again with the long career that I've had 
that in my early days we didn't have data. Yeah, we couldn't acquire data. In fact, I'm, I actually commissioned one of the first data loggers in the 80s. My inquiring mind said, you know, I can't, I, I want to know how these things work. I want the knowledge of what's going on. In those days, we relied a lot on the drivers. You move through that, that sort of era where electronics start to get on the cars. We start to learn how to apply the electronics. We start to learn how to measure things on the cars until we get to this sort of era where we've got so much data and then it's very difficult to work on it. That's quite interesting, you know, when we talk about how you push the boundaries all the time. And of course, a lot of people talk about AI, they talk about machine learning and stuff like this. And I was a really early adopter of this. When I was at Benetton in 1999 or 8, I started a project with Sheffield University using neural networks to look at vehicle handling. In those days, we didn't use standard ECUs, so we had our own data acquisition systems, we wrote our own software and everything. So I actually designed our whole data acquisition system such that it could be interrogated by what we would now call AI. Now, unfortunately, it was a little bit ahead of its time because you couldn't buy AI software, you had to write it all yourself. And equally, the computing power was, wasn't there. So it was a very difficult thing to do. But uh, I wish I'd pushed on with it a little bit more. We might have been way ahead by then. This episode is brought to you by Salesforce, the global partner of Formula One. Formula One is full of exciting moments, and they keep all 500 million of their fans closer to the action than ever before with the help of Salesforce. Remember the dramatic final restart at last year's Australian Grand Prix? Or Carlos Sainz holding on to win in the final laps in Singapore? It was amazing. Salesforce gives Formula One a single shared view of every fan so they can deliver one of a kind data driven experiences and race day updates that keep fans on the edge of their seats, whether they're at home, at the track, or on the go. With real-time data and actionable insights, Formula One puts every fan in the cockpit. Visit salesforce.com F1 to learn more about how Formula One wins fans and grows its global fan base with Salesforce. So Pat, when you compare the Formula One of today to the Formula One when you started in 1981. Are there more similarities or more differences? Well, wow, that's a really difficult question because of course there are both. Similarities are wanting to win, you know, the, the competitive nature, the, the mindset of anyone who's involved in Formula One, be they a driver, an engineer, a mechanic, the mindset is something special. Uh, and it's something I'm really interested in. It's something I've even written a book about recently. So there are those similarities, but in terms of the technology, vastly different. And when I go back and I look at, let's say, a 1981 car that I, I worked on and was very proud of at the time, I look at it now and I think, wow, yeah, <laughs> surely a dinosaur drove yeah. this. Tell me more about the mindset. What is the right Formula One mindset? I think the mindset is there is a solution there. Let's find it. Let's find it quickly. Let's get on with it. The target isn't going to move. You know, you can't put off the race. You've got a problem. You've got to solve it. You're at the back of the grid. You've got to get to the front and you've got to do it now. You're at the front of the grid. You've got to stay there. And it's this can-do attitude, which uh, I think is what makes working in Formula One so enjoyable. And something that, you know, if a little bit of that magic could rub off in other areas, then, oh, you know, we could, we could move so many different things forward. Well, and I'm reminded of, of COVID and everything that Formula One did during that crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's actually quite a good example because um, I remember well uh, on the, the sort of day when the first lockdown was starting, I, I got a call from someone in government who actually was an XF1 person and said, look, you know, what can we do about this? It was on a Tuesday. And I said, well, yeah, let's have a little think about it. I'll see what I can do. On Sunday, so just a few days later, we'd assembled at Red Bull Technology in Milton Keynes representatives from all the teams in the UK, 
from uh, the NHS, from the army medical, from the regulators, all sorts of people. And we said, right, we're going to meet this ventilator challenge. And we just set to work that day on the Sunday. And from then until Easter, it was 24 hours a day in shifts. There were three of us sort of running the project, if you like, that we used to have two meetings every evening, one at six o'clock to go through all the issues of the day, one at 10 o'clock in the evening to sort of write, what have we got to do tomorrow? It was a great project to be involved with because, of course, the, the end result was something really needed or we certainly perceived it to be really needed at the time. And it was a, an enormous challenge. So absolutely, you know, it was a, the Formula One of the, the health service. And do you know what? One thing that's not changed since 1981 is Formula One has never been a nine to five, has it? Oh, no, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, yeah, maybe nine to five, but not on the same day. <laughs> We're going to come on to drivers shortly, but there's so many comparisons that want to be made. You know, can Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen of today, could they have been champions 40, 50 years ago? What about engineers? If you parachuted, perhaps not Adrian Newey, because he was around at, at that time, but if you parachuted one of the young engineers now back into Formula One of 1981, how would they have coped? Equally, you of 1981, if you'd been parachuted into 2023, how would you have coped now? Yeah, I think that's, it, it's difficult. You know, I'm a multidisciplined engineer. Uh, I may have started, you know, my career with a specialization in vehicle dynamics, but I've had to get involved with aerodynamics, with stress analysis, with design, with running a team at the racetrack, with, with all these sort of things. And in the 80s, you had the opportunity to do that sort of thing. Uh, you couldn't be a, a sort of specialist. The teams are very small. When, when I started at Tolman, I was employee number 20. By the time we went racing, we had, a, from memory, 65 people. That included all our production, our race team, our administration, everything. So you compare that now with teams, you know, which are approaching a thousand people. And these days, the engineers are much more compartmentalized. You know, they, they absolutely know their subject to the nth degree, more so than I ever did and ever will. But sometimes it's very hard for them to get the complete picture. And, you know, I, I've seen incredibly clever aerodynamicists who will design a wing and it's an elegant piece of work but when you look at it you say well how on earth am I going to get a structure in there that will actually support these marvelous loads that you say it's going to give and they can't think of that because that's not what they're trained with whereas you know in, in those early days we had to do everything so you learned from doing it and you all. become a very practical engineer you do and you know i can even go back to pre-formula one when i was designing formula ford cars for 2000 formula three in those days you know I, I designed the car i made quite a lot of it i drove the truck to the circuit drove it all over europe i mechanicked on the car when we got to the circuit and um yeah, you know, those are things that probably are very, very difficult for, for young engineers to, to get those skills now. I bet you loved that era. I did. From a technical point of view, when was peak F1 for you in your career? Uh, 2025, <laughs> 26. <laughs> okay. When is peak? You know, there isn't a peak. I think as an engineer, the projects I really enjoyed were the times when we had the active suspension, four-wheel steer, power braking all these sort of things you know they they were you know they were an engineering dream uh, and I really did enjoy working on those things they really stretched the boundaries of what we could do at the time but honestly I, I've just enjoyed every year I've been in racing every year produces a new challenge sometimes that challenge comes because the regulations have got tighter and rather than sort of saying well okay, I can't do that anymore. I always say you can't unlearn things. You know, if you've learned that something makes a car go faster and someone says, well, you can't do that anymore, you say, okay, well, what's the next best thing I can do? Because I know where I'm aiming at. I just, I can't take the direct route anymore. I need to take a circular route to get to it. 
Can I ask you a bit more about that four-wheel steer, traction control, active ride car? I think we're talking about 1993. I think Correct. that was peak electronics, wasn't it? And you had Schumacher and Patrese were your Correct. drivers. Do you feel Formula One had gone too far at that time? Had they taken too much away from the driver? And what did Michael in particular have to say? Did, did he relish that or did he feel that he had less influence? Michael loved it. Ricardo hated it. <laughs> it was as simple as that. Those cars, of course, they, they handled in a very different manner to a passive car. I think Ricardo, he was a classic driver. He knew how a car should handle. That's what he wanted. He didn't really know how to get it there. But if it was like that, he could drive it. Michael was just always exploring new limits. OK, well, it might feel different, but actually the stopwatch has just told me it's gone faster. So I like that and I will adapt to it. On those active cars, we had so many controls on them. We could do so many things with them. And it was really a question of even the driver had to explore the design space. He had to say, right, okay, what can I do through this corner? What do I need? And then once he'd discovered it, he would just exploit it. So, Do you think we'll ever go back to a day where we have all those electronics back on the car? No, I don't, actually. Um, you know, we, we do still talk about having active suspension on the cars, but believe it or not, for simplicity. Now, a lot of people think they were incredibly complex, and in their day they were because the, the electronics wasn't very mature. Um, we didn't know as much about hydraulics as we do now, so they appeared complex. But the reality is that a mechanical analogy for it can actually be a very complex thing as well because again i go back to the fact you can't unlearn things so you know what an active car could do and i think one of the reasons we had so much success in 94 95 was that having understood why our active car was good and it was a good car i think we then looked at how we produced the analogy of that in a passive car and I think that was something that we did very well at Benetton. And perhaps Williams, for example, who were the challengers at the time, didn't get all of it right. At Benetton, we, we didn't just try and make a passive chassis that replicated what we'd had with the active car, but we understood we were never going to get quite there. Therefore, we also needed to change the aerodynamics. And we needed to widen the aerodynamic map out. And I think that's probably what Williams didn't do. How interesting, because we we had Adrian Newey on the podcast last year, and he said pretty much exactly... Well, I didn't know, we didn't talk about Benetton, but in terms of what was going on at Williams, he said pretty much exactly what you've just said. It's an interesting mix, isn't it? Because I look at you now, and that you're, you're looking after the show, Pat, as well, when you're, when you're thinking of the regulations. And it seems to me to be a constant battle between what the engineers want, what the drivers want, and what the show needs. Do we ever get to a point where we can satisfy all three of those things at the same time? Probably not. Um, I think, though, that everyone needs to remember why they're in this fabulous sport and what enables them to be in this fabulous sport. And that is our fans. And, you know, without fans, there wouldn't be the television, there wouldn't be the sponsorship, there wouldn't be the welcoming that we get all over the world. So we've got to put fans first, and that means we've got to entertain them. And that's a very interesting thing that, you know, over the last seven years that I've been with Formula One, having left the, the sort of teams, um, I've had to learn an awful lot about because it's not a one-size-fits-all answer. We have a lot of our traditional fans, some of whom are very interested in technical aspects, some of whom aren't. We have a lot of new fans, very different demographics, and we have to actually, we have to produce a show that they're going to enjoy. Not just the racing, but, you know, I think one of the great things that, that Liberty brought to Formula One was the fact that it's an event, you know, and it's got to be the most spectacular event on the planet. So it's an entire weekend. So we're talking about the show. Do Formula One cars need to be the fastest cars in the world, point to point? I don't think they do. Um, Isn't that its USP? It, no, I don't think it is its USP. I think it, the USP is that they are the best cars. 
driven by the best drivers, do they have to be the fastest? It would take a little bit of explaining if they weren't, but I always use the example of rallying. Rallying's really interesting because I personally love watching rallying. And I love watching it because when I watch a, a Formula One car, even with the knowledge I've got, I can't help thinking, well, I can see what they're doing. I know I couldn't do it, but I wonder how close I could get to it. When I watch a guy in a rally car, I just think, wow, I, I'm not even going to get close to that. So there we've got a, a competition where we're really seeing what the driver does. We're not seeing close racing or overtaking. We're seeing cars on the stage separated. We're just seeing what a car can do. And it's certainly not the fastest car. So it's a really interesting question. We certainly do regard being the fastest car around any given circuit as being quite important. But actually, the ultimate, I don't think, matters. So, for example, with the 2026 car, it won't be quite as fast as a 2025 car on any given circuit. Now, if it was 20 seconds slower, I think we'd worry. If it's three, four, five seconds slower, I really don't think it matters, providing we've got spectacular racing. And is it important that we attract the best drivers in the world? Yeah, I, I do think it's important. And you know, as an engineer, I'd love to say, well, actually, it's the engineering that matters and we've got to attract the best engineers in the world. But we've already done that. <laughs> but no, seriously, our, our fans like the drivers. Uh, the teams are, are interesting because, of course, you get the, the Ferrari fans who will be there forever and a day. But fans are also quite fickle at times and you know uh, I remember our, our time with Alonso when you looked at the grandstand and everyone was wearing blue and yellow and a couple of years ago they were all wearing silver and now they're all wearing blue and orange and and those sort of things will change and that shows I think you know how important the drivers are. Selling a little or a lot. Shopify helps you do your thing however you ka -ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're just launching your online shop, opening your first bricks and mortar store, or celebrating hitting a million orders, Shopify is there to help you grow every step of the way. And it doesn't matter if you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. With their all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, you can reach customers wherever they are. Shopify holds the record for the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, helping you turn browsers into buyers like nobody else. And that's not all. Streamline your operations and enhance customer experiences with Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Think of it as your personal commerce assistant, on hand to help you sell more with less effort. I just love how empowering Shopify is for business owners, giving you total control over your brand and all the tools you need to take it to the next level. It's a real confidence boost and an added bonus that their award-winning help is there to support your success through every step. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US, and it's the global force behind Allbirds, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash beyond the grid, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash beyond the grid now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash beyond the grid. Let's talk about some of the drivers you've worked with now. You've been lucky enough to work, I think, with three megas, world champions, but there's a few others I'd love to discuss with you. But let's do it in chronological order. Ayrton Senna, 1984, he joins Tolman. It was his first year in Formula One. How quickly did you know that you had a diamond there? I think, you know, I'd love to say, oh, it was obvious straight away, but... You know, we, we've followed the careers of, of people and in 83, Ayrton had been racing Martin Brundle in, in Formula 3 and, you know, you couldn't separate the two of them. Very, very close racing. They both appeared to be as good. We knew that we were getting someone who was good. But I have to say that once he'd 
he sort of sat in a Formula One car, it was a little bit surprising how he just, it was like he'd been there all his life. And I think that's an interesting thing because when you look at what's going on in Formula 3, Formula 2, whatever it might be, and leading up into Formula 1, you don't always get a complete impression of whether someone's going to be a great Formula 1 driver. And there are instances where some people adapt and some don't. Some get in the right car, some don't. Now, I can't say that Ayrton got in the right car because our car, that first car, which was an evolution of the previous year's car, actually was a very difficult car to drive. We were talking earlier about the amount of data that we have. We didn't have it then. You know, it's hard to believe, but if we wanted to get the gear ratios right, we had to ask the driver to look at the rev counter at the end of the straight. We wanted to get the the radiator blanking right. We had to ask him what the oil and water temperatures were because we didn't know any of these things. We didn't have telemetry. We didn't even have onboard data that we could look at when the car stopped. So the requirements of a driver were very different and the driver had to really understand what was going on with the car. And Ayrton was, he was really just exceptional at that. Exceptionally bright. Definitely exceptionally bright, but that's a a common trait in all the good drivers I've worked with. They're all very intelligent people. What was his standout quality in that first season? The one thing that stood out that was on the other side of quality was his lack of fitness. That that was a real problem in his first year. And it it was, he was very strong minded. And when we said, look, you know, you can go faster if you were a bit fitter. And Kyle Armu had to lift him out of the car. Because of his sort of strong, almost pig-headedness, you know, he wouldn't accept things like that. But that same quality, when it came to anything else, really drove him. So, you know, he'd say, oh, the car's doing this, or the car's doing that, or I need this, or I need that. And when he said it, you listened, because he knew what he was talking about. I'm really surprised you had to tell him to be fit. He struck me as a bloke who just, as you say, felt like he'd been there all his life. It, that's such a fundamental part of it, surely. Yeah, it's very different in those days. You know, it, it wasn't until Michael Schumacher came along that Michael realised that fitness was a uh, was part of the competitive makeup, and uh, none of the drivers really knew it at that time. You know, you'd see someone like Keki Rosberg get out of the car and start smoking, and you know, and they'd go out in the evening and come back in the sort of early hours of the morning, and then go and, and practice. It, it wasn't the professional athletes that they are now but Ayrton really was amazing and and I'll tell you a story about him that I think sums it all up it was in Dallas we we raced just once in Dallas in 1984 we qualified reasonably well I think from memory we dropped back I think he may even have spun early on but anyway he was pulling his way back we're in a reasonable position and he hit the wall when he hit the wall, it broke a drive shaft and we retired. And at the end of the race, we were doing our debrief and, and Ayrton said, you know, the wall moved. The wall had moved. And I was like, yes, Ayrton, you know, of course it moved. I haven't had that excuse before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a new one. It, it was definitely page 10 of the driver's book of excuses. But, you know, the way he was, and I was saying earlier how strong-minded he was, he, you know, he persuaded me to actually go out there and have a look at that particular exit of that corner. And sure enough, when we went and had a look at it, you, you got to remember this, Dallas was a temporary street circuit. In those days, the street circuits were just delineated by these huge concrete blocks that were just dropped down, and, and that made the circuit. And uh, they weren't fixed to the ground or anything. They just the, the fact they were so heavy just kept them there. But when we looked at this particular block that he'd hit, we saw that at the sort of, far edge of it there were tire marks and what had happened was that a car previous to him arriving there had touched the far edge of the block which had pivoted it about the center and so the leading edge had moved out a few millimeters and I mean a few millimeters five mil something like that Ayrton drove with such precision that that five mil meant everything so next time round, the wall had moved five mil maybe ten Maybe maybe uh, <laughs> That's time sort of makes things a, a bit Such better, precision. but certainly not much. Yeah. And that was enough for him to, to just clip it. Was he a detail guy? What was his feedback like? 
Yeah. Very much a detail guy. Uh, and again, you know, in those days, everything wasn't as professional as it is now. But certainly we still did debriefs and all this sort of stuff. We didn't have data to go through, but we'd still sit there and we would talk about it. We'd talk about all the different things we could do on the car, where its shortcomings were, etc. So, yeah, very much a detail guy. And what about Monaco 84? It's the wet race. Senna overtakes Alain Prost for the lead, but the race is red flagged controversially in some eyes. And of course, the lap count goes back, so Prost wins the race. Senna is second. How did he deal with that disappointment? How did we all deal with that disappointment? Well, actually, how did you, Pat Simmons, deal with <laughs> yeah, that? That's a good point. I know. It's a, a little bit of background to that. We'd, we'd started the season in 84 with uh, the 83 car uh, running on Pirelli tyres. The 83 car was, let's face it, a bit of a dog. It, it could on occasions be quite fast. It was incredibly difficult to set up. It, it didn't know the meaning of the word sweet spot. It was just, you know, occasionally you could get it to go fast, but it was it was really hard. It was really heavy to drive. It was really difficult. We learned from it. The 84 car we introduced mid-season, French Grand Prix actually at Dijon. Much, much better car, but equally big factor would change from Pirelli to Michelin. Hard to imagine something like that yeah. now, isn't it? But, you know, in those days, there was a free tyre choice and we even changed mid-season. And suddenly we had a car on our hands that was actually, you know, this was competitive. I mean, forgetting Monaco, it finished on the podium a, a few times. Yeah, there. three times, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. One thing that bugs me to this day, actually, was that when we did the deal with Michelin, Michelin wanted to get the agreement of all the other teams that we could, our little Tolman team, you know, got our first point the year before, <laughs> could we go into Michelin's? And all the teams said, yeah, no problem. Ron Dennis said, yes, but they can't have the, the same tyres as us. They can't be the current tyres. So we were always running, apart from Estrell at the end of the season, which is another story, but every race we were running on old generation tyres, previous year's generation of tyres except at Monaco, because there wasn't a previous generation of wet. So for the first time, we were actually on the same tyres as McLaren and the other Michelin runners. And yeah, we, we gave them a race, didn't we? And I didn't know how to deal with it. I, I didn't know whether to be ecstatic that we finished second or just devastated that we didn't finish first. And ultimately, I was devastated that we didn't win it because... You know, second is first to the losers. Isn't and it? do you still feel what, that yeah. way now? Yeah, probably even more so. Now. Right, yeah. Did you maintain a relationship with Ayrton after he left at the end of the year to go to Lotus? Yeah, uh, I did. Um, I try not to get too close to the drivers. And I always used to tell younger engineers who, you know, used to sort of hero worship them. I used to say, look, they are employees. They just happen to earn more than you and do a different job. So you, you have to bear that in mind and, and if you get too close to them it can become quite awkward because they're transient figures in the team you know the, a driver will not generally stay with the team as long as the engineers and mechanics people like that so you need to be a little bit careful but I liked Ayrton I respected him immensely but I didn't form the close relationship with him that I did for example with Michael Schumacher or even some of the people like John Lacey and Gerhard Berger and people like that but, yeah, we always talked in the paddock, um, always asked how things were going, but uh, it wasn't a close relationship. Is that because you're the boss, that you didn't like to form that relationship with drivers, and that if they needed, if you needed to tell them to buck their ideas up, it was easier to do it if you weren't that close? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's not just drivers, you know, it's one of the, if you like, being isolated a little bit when you, you're managing a, a team of people, you... Yeah, you want to be friends with them. You need to be friends with them. But at the same time, you have to occasionally discipline people. So, Pat, Tolman morphs into Benetton. And let's fast forward to 1991. We've mentioned Michael Schumacher in passing already. But after the Belgian Grand Prix that year, he joins your team. When did you first become aware that he was you know, in the crosshairs and that Flavio wanted him? You've got to remember that I didn't work for Benetton in 91. You were at Reynard. Exactly. Although I'd worked for Benetton up until 1990, 
a number of us had a bit of a falling out with John Barnard. We went off to do the, the Reynard project. Never thought we'd go back to, to Benetton. But then when John left Benetton, Flavio Briatore asked us to come back. We did. And Michael already then was the, the Benetton driver because all the shenanigans had happened the, the year before. So I was his race engineer. I prefer to say he was my driver, but <laughs> <laughs> we went off and the first test in, in those days was in Kailami. That's when we really got to know each other. I remember well a sort of turning point in, in our relationship. I have to say I like Michael from the minute I met him. I knew he was good. I'd seen what he'd done the previous year. But we needed to establish that, that sort of relationship. So we're testing at Kyle Army. Car was going reasonably well, reasonably competitive. Third, fourth, I can't remember exactly, but, you know, we, we were up there. And the car was quite nicely balanced. What he had was a, there's one fast corner there, and he had a, a bit of oversteer through there. Slower corners, a little bit of understeer, but, you know, it, it was generally okay. And he said, look, we want to tackle the, the fast corner. That's where I think I can make up time. And I said, yeah, that is where you make up time you always do in the, in the fast corners so uh he said oh well you know uh, we should take a bit of front wing off and i said no that, that won't do it that's just going to mess up your your slow corners and things even even more i said what we need to do is uh we need a, a stiffer rear roll bar and he said well stiffer rear roll bar it's going to make it oversteer more isn't it i said no what it's going to do is it's going to keep the car from hitting the rear bump rubbers in that corner uh, or going as deep into the rear bump rubbers and you'll find it nicely balanced through there and actually reduce some of your understeer in the slow corners. We did it. He wasn't at all convinced. He went out and he said, that's fantastic. And from that point on, we just totally trusted each other. And it was a really nice sort of relationship that uh, I'd, all I had to do was explain to him why I was thinking in a particular way. In fact, in later years, probably didn't even need to explain to him. But we had that, that sort of mutual trust. He trusted what I was doing with the car. If I said to him he needed to do something, I could trust him to do it. Does an engineer need a moment like that with every driver they work with just to establish that trust? That certainly was a moment. That was a very clearly defined moment. It doesn't often happen like that. In fact, that's the only time I'd say in my career where it really happened like that. If I talk about, you know... Uh, Alonso and people like that it didn't happen as a, a singular event but certainly you need to have the mutual respect the mutual trust the mutual communication is very very important so you work with both Senna and Schumacher very early on in their careers where were they similar where were they different well we, we spoke earlier about the the vast difference in what's required of drivers through through the ages and it's quite interesting, if you take three champions that I, I, I worked with in Senna, Schumacher, Alonso, the interesting thing is there's a decade between each one that I worked with. Decades a long time. In motorsport, it's forever. It's centuries. You know, the sport changes so fast that a decade, it, it, it just changes the whole scenery of what you need from the team, from the driver, etc., when you try and compare the drivers, you're really looking at a very different sort of sport almost. But the one thing you see in all the good drivers that I've worked with is this incredible self-esteem. They are people who believe they're the best in the world and they go out there and they prove they're the best in the world. And they do things with the car that I'd say a normal human being just couldn't do. But they believe they can do it and therefore they do it. But when we're talking about Michael, I feel there is a but. And maybe it's linked to that self-esteem. But I now want to talk about the flawed genius that's Michael with, I'm thinking, Adelaide 94 with him and Damon Hill and the championship falling to Michael. Then fast forward to Jerez 97. And then there's Monaco 2006, I think, in the Ferrari as well when he, can we say, parked it at Raskast. Were you surprised that there was that side to Michael. Yeah, I was. I guess the first time we saw it, maybe, was in Adelaide in 94. I remember it as if it was yesterday. First world championship for me, you know, so everything resting on it. 
that close fight. The, the race before in Japan had been immensely disappointing where Damon had absolutely just blown us away. And um, perhaps the only time I ever worked with Michael when he didn't quite really understand what he had to do. It was a two-part race and we added times together and we needn't go into that. But we arrived then in Adelaide, everything to play for. Simple equation, we needed to beat Damon. Um, if he beat us, he was champion. If we beat him, we were champions. And then the, the infamous accident. I remember my emotions very well because I I sort of thought, oh, we're going to get into trouble for this. You know, the stewards are going to have something to say about it. Really, I, I wasn't happy. And so that must have meant that somewhere in the back of my mind, I wondered whether it wasn't just an accident. But then I convinced myself it was an accident. You know, I, I, I looked at the video, I looked at the car, I saw that... Um, lost the steering so he didn't have control of the car and therefore you know as far as I was concerned it was an accident the stewards never questioned it so we got on and had a couple of beers and celebrated winning our first world championship didn't really think much more about it until you get to 97 until you get to these other incidents and then you think now that is surprising because Michael is a lovely lovely guy he, he's one of the nicest, if not the nicest, driver I ever worked with. He, he was such a personable person. He, he knew everyone in the garage. He knew their wives. He knew their children. He knew what they were doing. He would talk to them, you know, on the Thursday and discuss, you know, as if they were live next door to them. Um, he was that sort of guy. So to see that slightly, I think you called it a flawed side to his character, was, was really surprising. And, you know, I think about, I've thought about this a lot. The only thing I can think of is that he didn't make the best decisions when he had to make them very quickly. But all I can say is that if that's the only flawed side to the genius, he's still just the nicest guy you could ever imagine and one of the best drivers ever. Our next sponsor, OneSkin, is all about keeping it simple when it comes to your skincare routine. Founded by four PhDs dedicated to skin longevity, OneSkin proves that better skin doesn't need a complicated regimen. Their magic ingredient, the OS1 peptide. It's the first scientifically proven ingredient to reduce the buildup of senescent cells, those pesky zombie cells that contribute to skin aging. With fewer of these zombie cells lurking around, you get younger, healthier-looking skin with fewer lines and wrinkles, faded age spots, and a stronger, natural barrier. And with the changing seasons in full swing, what better time to try something new? And for a limited time, our listeners will get an exclusive 15% off their first OneSkin purchase using the code GRID when you check out at oneskin.co. Long-haul flights can cause havoc on your skin, and I'm really grateful to be trying out the OS1 Face Moisturizer. I love that it can be used on your hands and neck, because as you may know, I'm in Melbourne at the moment and that Australian sun can be intense to say the least. First impressions, it makes my skin feel really smooth and hydrated, which is great for me now that we're filming some episodes of Beyond the Grid, and I love the refillable packaging. One Skin is more than skincare. It's about skin longevity, targeting the root causes of aging to help you look and feel your best at every age. Get started today with 15% off using the code GRID at oneskin.co. That's 15% off at oneskin.co with the code GRID. After you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them and please support our show and tell them that we sent you. It's time to expect more from your skincare routine. Invest in the health of your skin with OneSkin. You've talked about your immediate reaction after Adelaide, but once you'd got home and you were back, you know, within the, the, the bosom of your family, back with the team in England, how did you reflect on that whole 94 season? Because it had been such a traumatic time for everybody in Formula One, but you were really in the eye of the storm, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's a really good question, Tom, because, you know, I very nearly quit at the end of that season. I was distraught at the, the accusations that were, were levelled at us. 
most of which were, were totally unjustified. And, uh, you know, you look at a disqualification in Spa where the, the plank was declared illegal. They didn't follow the proper procedures to establish whether it was legal or not. They were quite different in those days. And had they followed the proper procedures, actually we wouldn't have been disqualified. The accusations of traction control, absolutely, I will say to my dying day, there was absolutely nothing wrong with that car. There was no traction control. There was no launch control. There, there was nothing. The car was 100% legal. So all the things that got thrown at us, Silverstone with the black flag, Absolutely, how we reacted to the black flag was wrong, but the fact that we were shown the black flag for such a tiny little infringement that had happened so many times before, which was going past on the on the formation lap, I absolutely knew that the world was against us. I said, you know, at the end of 94, I nearly quit. I had two options. Either quit or put your money where your mouth is and go and do it again. And that was what 95 was all about to go out there and do it again and show that we could do it. And that was really, really important to me. Yeah, 94 may have been the first one, and normally the first points you score, the first win you get, the, the first championship you get is the one that you, you remember. But 95 was the one where I felt there was no controversy, there was no argument. We went out there and we beat them. And that doesn't take away from any of the others you now. 2005, 2006, what a difficult championship that was. So to come through at the end in Brazil of that one and actually get the championship when I just saw it slipping away from us so easily. But Pat, it's the competitor in you that's shining through now talking to you. And when I, I sat down with Adrian Newey last year, another brilliant engineer, but he is ruthlessly competitive as well. You can't just be an academic in this game, can you? You really need that competitive side. Oh, yeah. Life's a competition. You know, if I'm queuing up at the airport, I get really annoyed if I'm in a slower queue than the guy next to me. Can we just fast forward now? Schumacher leaves at the end of 95. He goes to Ferrari. There's a bit of an exodus from the team. Technically, the following year, Ross Braun goes, Rory Byrne goes. How difficult was that time for Benetton? And for you personally? It was very difficult. Michael was going, which, you know, that hurt, that hurt us. There's no doubt about it. Ross said that he was going. Michael asked me if I'd go to Ferrari, and I certainly thought about it. But what really happened then, it was a bit of a turning point in my career because Ross wanted me to take his position. He wanted me to be technical director of Benetton. I'd been chief engineer up to that point. It was interesting because Rory had said he was going to retire. I hadn't said he was going to Ferrari at the time. I felt I had the best job in the world, chief engineer at Benetton. Yeah, wow, all the fun without all the responsibility. Well, why on earth would I want to be a technical director? And so I wasn't terribly keen on it at the time, but Ross and Flavio both wanted me to do that job. And so I decided that I wasn't going to join the Exodus to Ferrari, where I was just going to be another race engineer. I, I needed to take my career forward. So eventually I, I accepted the job uh, as technical director at Benetton. It was a really important part of my career, and I'm really pleased I did it. And I, I continually thank Ross for the, the faith he showed in me to recommend me to take that position. But is there a part of you that wishes you'd done the Ferrari thing at some point? Uh, I, I think in my archives at home, I think I've got three Ferrari contracts, actually. <laughs> I, maybe the last one didn't actually come to the contract, but I certainly got two and certainly been and talked to them three times. So there were the, What there were stopped times. you each time? Okay, one well, the time first, was the, the, the technical director. Yeah, the first of, time was technical director. The third time um, was actually when, when Stefano was, was there. And then, of course, there was so many politics going on. <laughs> By the time it got round to actually talking about a contract, Stefano had already gone. So it sort of, that one died the death. So it's lovely to be working with him again or, or for the first time. Uh, the middle one, I remember going to an interview at Monza with Jean Todd. Again, I think it was actually probably Ross was recommending me to go there. I don't know. I just didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel it was the right thing to do, and I never quite knew why. Maybe I didn't get on with Jean in quite the way I did with, with Ross or, or, or something, but 
something wasn't quite right, so I didn't do it. Isn't it interesting? Because obviously Lewis Hamilton is going there for 25, and I'm sure the same thought process has been going through his head as he had the contract sat in front of him. I mean, I, there have been a few contracts, I think, in front of Lewis like you as well. And finally, though, he's buckled and he said, I'm going to do it because it is something I've always wanted to do. Uh, it is interesting, though, that you always stopped yourself. Yeah, it's different, though. I think, um, you know, Lewis has he's been so successful, hasn't he? He is reaching the end of his career. I don't mean imminently, but, you know, it is probably his last move. So... Everyone has that thing about Ferrari. There's no doubt about it. There's certainly some kudos with Ferrari. In my case, I wasn't near the end of my career. I was in the middle of my career. My career had actually started taking off. Benetton Technical Director, then Executive Director of Engineering at Renault. My career was good. I didn't need to find a retirement home or anything <laughs> like that. Well, there was, on the driver front at least, a bit of a... And this is... So it sounds disrespectful to the Burgers, the Alaces, the Kovalainens, and it's not meant to be. But in terms of the mega stars, there was a lull between when Michael left and really when Fernando Alonso arrived. But there was one driver I wanted to ask you about, and that is Jensen Button. He goes on to win the world championship later on, but he was with you for two years, 2001, 2002. It never quite clicked. That was my feeling from the outside looking in. And I wanted to ask you why. It's a good question, and, and you're quite right. You know, we'd been through some drivers. I think when Michael left, uh, Flavio was quite affronted by it. So, you know, his, his solution to that was to take both the Ferrari drivers. And unfortunately, they were expensive. And, you know, that made a big hole in our budget. And that was a bit of a turning point, which rattles on down the line to when Jensen was with us. Having won the championship in 94, 95, we'd obviously you know, increased our income we needed to spend it wisely and uh, some of it we did you know in the wind tunnel etc as we moved into the late 90s really we were in quite a difficult position and I remember at the time as technical director my real job was that I felt the only way we were going to survive at that time was to get aligned with a, a major manufacturer that was what I was doing was trying to look at how we presented ourselves as a big team but actually on a remarkably small budget now of course Rory had left and Rory had been such a, a brilliant designer of the cars I have to say that you know the, the 99 car the 2000 car the 2001 car they really weren't the best cars and I think Jensen coming in new to Formula One in a car that was quite difficult to drive I, th I think it was very difficult for him Jensen was a guy who needed support and Flavio was not the sort of guy who supported drivers. Yeah, he supported Michael, but if there was a little chink, you know, Flavio would, would be in there and with a lot of drivers, that was a good thing. He, they needed a bit of a G up. With Jensen, it absolutely didn't work. I think Jensen felt very unloved in the team, which wasn't true. We actually, we really, really liked him. If you found yourself stuck in a cycle of cooking the same meals again and again, or saving recipes on social media for meal prep that you never get round to making, Factor can help you break that cycle, bring some flavour back to your life, and save you time in the process. Eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. All their meals are fresh, never frozen, and chef-crafted, and they're ready to go in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat and eat. No prep, no mess. Factor knows that variety is key when you're trying to eat well, no matter what your goals are. And that's why you'll find more than 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus and Keto. And there are more than 60 add-ons that will keep you fueled up and feeling good all day long. And that's your midday munchies sorted. Everything I've tried has tasted great too. My favourite dish is the jalapeno cheddar lime chicken with cauliflower rice. The chicken was really moist and flavourful, and they've clearly mastered the perfect balance of spice with the jalapenos and melted cheddar cheese. Mmm! Factor is entirely flexible to suit your schedule. Just choose as little or as many meals as you need each week, and pause or reschedule your deliveries any time. It's the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, premium options with no cooking or cleanup required. And it's much less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. So head to factormeals.com/grid50 and use the code grid50 to get 50% off. 
That's code GRID50 at factormeals.com slash GRID50 to get 50% off. So when Alonso joins, funnily enough, in Jensen's last year, he was the test driver, wasn't he? Then he gets the race seat in 2003. Now, talk about competitive. He is ferocious, isn't he? And was that the sort of turning point? Did he give you the energy to drive things forward? Yeah, I mean, th- these things don't happen in isolation, of course. But absolutely, you know, we again, we recognised in, in Fernando what we'd seen in Michael what I'd seen in Ayrton all those years ago. Being probably the best driver at the time wasn't enough if we couldn't give him a, a decent car. But we were starting to get our, our act together our, on the car side. You know, we were producing a, a decent car. The, the first car he drove, uh, actually, you know, his testing had, had really played quite a lot of part in making that a a decent car and then of course we got the the win in Hungary in 2003 and that that's an important thing for any driver you know you see it time and time again someone who once they get their first win and again it goes to the self-esteem thing we were talking about earlier builds up the self-esteem I've won I can do it again why shouldn't I do it again and I think that was the same with Fernando ferociously competitive as you say very very high self-esteem but that win, coming so early in his career, he was at the time the youngest driver to win a Grand Prix. It set the scene. We had a decent car. We had a very, very good working relationship with Michelin on the tyres. And yeah, things were back on track again after the fallow years previously. So why did he leave? You've won back-to-back titles, 2-5, two 2-6. Two Everything's great. The relationship sounds great between you and him the whole team and him. Tell me if I'm wrong, but it seemed he was the focus of the team. There's nothing more he could have wanted as a racing driver. So why did he go to McLaren? I wish I could answer that, Tom. I honestly don't know. Fernando's a a complex character. I still like Fernando. I'm not sure he liked us too much at the end of 86. I don't know whether you remember, but there was a an incident in Japan when he had a press conference and he said, you know, I don't feel the team's behind me. And, uh, yeah, that hurt us. Because Where did that come from? No idea. Maybe he'd made up his mind he was moving on and he was trying to justify it. Maybe he genuinely felt it. But if he did, I really don't know why. But Fernando is a complex character. Very, very competitive, as you say. Very intelligent. Remarkably intelligent. You know, Fernando in a debrief used to amaze me because... In the early days before I really got to know him, he'd sit in the debrief and you think, he's just not paying attention just doesn't seem to be with us and then he'd ask a question and you think where on earth did that come from that is the best question I've heard a driver ever ask and you knew that he was absolutely on top of everything he's probably intelligent enough to know that it's very difficult to keep a winning streak going and maybe it was time to move now having said that of course he's got a habit of moving to the wrong place (laughs) at the wrong time I think only Fernando can can answer that if you were Toto Wolf would you put him alongside George Russell for a season or two next year? Yep. You would. You really <laughs> I think would. I really the Fernando rate, aged 43. I, I really rate the guy. I think he's yeah. incredibly fast. So it, if I was looking for what's the, the best result I could get in 2025, who do I need to help me with my brand new 2026 car to a totally new set of regulations? Fernando's your man. However, then you're left with a problem, aren't you? You're left with the problem of George, who's been there a few years and thinking of where do I go next? Fernando, who probably at that point says, yeah, okay, I've proven it. Uh, It's time to move on. People always underestimate the value of continuity. Continuity in a team is so important when the engineers and the drivers and everyone are working together. And... To ensure you've got continuity, you really need to make sure you stagger your drivers. You need to make sure that you've got a good succession planning in your engineers and and things like this. So I think if I was Toto, I would do it. But I'd be thinking, okay, well, what's my next move? Because you've got to look further down the line. Right. Simmons Grand Prix. You've got to choose two of Senna, Schumacher or Alonso. Who's in? Schumacher. No doubt about that. Heartbeat, I notice. Yep. Yep. Then, you know, I think Alonso, because Senna probably 
really, really high on natural ability. How would he adapt to modern Formula One? Really don't know. Really don't know. So I'd probably go on the, the safer choice. And is there any driver of the last 40 years who you didn't work with, who you would have loved to have worked with? Yeah, Lewis. I have so much respect for the guy. And he's everything that I believe a driver shouldn't be. And yet he wins. You know, I, I always used to say to my drivers, you've got to concentrate on what you're doing. You've only got one job. Do it properly. Don't get sidetracked with anything else. And I would get pretty annoyed if they did. Lewis, he has multiple lives. And yet he's still absolutely fantastic. I would love to work with him. I'd love to understand how he works and what it is that makes him so great. And yeah, really miss that one. Well, Pat, you can scratch that Ferrari itch next year. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Actually, is there any engineer that you would have liked to have worked with who you haven't? Well, I guess the obvious answer is Adrian, but maybe if I, uh, I think he'd probably fired me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's, let's end this just by throwing it forward now. 2026, I guess that is front and central in your world now. What is the goal? What, are we, what is the sport trying to achieve with the new regs? We're talking three times the electrical power, it's sustainable fuel. We want people to come to watch a race and say, wow, gosh, look what they're doing. Yeah, it's sustainable fuel. Didn't even know you could do that. Thought you had to dig it out of the ground. They're managing to power the whole paddock sustainably wow that's that's impressive isn't it biodiversity we're doing a biodiversity project at silverstone you know who knew i think that these sort of things are really important and actually for me they're fascinating as well because you know uh, you take the the sustainable fuels that's very much been my project it was a, an idea that i came up with quite early on and started pushing it forward i'm a mechanical engineer yeah i did chemistry at school but uh, I had to go and buy my chemistry books again and, and learn all about sustainable fuels and things. And that's the sort of thing I said, you know, I have this, this thirst for knowledge. That's the sort of thing that keeps me going is uh, really these new technologies that we have to embrace. So for the manufacturers, for years, the incentive for being in Formula One was win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Do you feel that's now shifted is technology more of the incentive now? Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, I think technology at a sensible cost. We talk a lot about the, the 2022 car and how it's improved racing and all the things we did, but the budget cap doesn't really get the, the medals it deserves because the budget cap is fundamental to the future of Formula One. You know, we've gone from a state, my, my last team was Williams, where we were existing on a shoestring and in fact not long after I left Williams it didn't exist on a shoestring they, they had to sell and they weren't alone you know teams were really struggling to survive over the course of seven years we've turned these teams into all being worth half a billion dollars and that's pretty impressive and a large part of that is because of the budget cap now when you talk about the manufacturers they're saying, yeah, actually, now this is interesting technology and it's not at a ridiculous price. We're not having to put hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into it, but we can exploit the areas that are of interest to us. So sustainable fuel. Yeah, that's a nice little project for them to be working on. Electric motor technology, battery cells, battery cell technology is fascinating. You know, people think a lithium ion battery is a lithium ion battery. It's not. It's like saying a metal is a metal, you know, is it steel, is it aluminium, is it magnesium? That There are so many different chemistries out there for, for batteries and the really interesting ones are being exploited in Formula One. So there's still plenty of technology there for the manufacturers. They will be, at the moment, cars with, with electrical power, you know, fully in and every 900 horsepower. We're going to be over 1,000 horsepower with the 26 car, a lot more of it coming from the electric motor. At the moment, turbo lag does not exist on these cars because we have an electric motor on the turbo. That's going. Turbo lag is not what it used to be in the old days. We do want to reduce the downforce on the car. It's part of the reason why the cars are so heavy is because they're having to deal with so much load. So they'll slide a little bit more. I think what it will do is it will put a little bit more emphasis on the driver and 
as we were saying earlier, I think that's an important thing. It's the drivers who are the heroes that, uh, you know, they're the supermen that we want to promote. So, yeah, I think things are going in the right direction there. Pat, thank you very much for your time. It's been really fun to chat through it all. Your enthusiasm is infectious. I remember you telling me you were trying to retire back in 2022. I, I feel that that is not even in your thoughts. Uh, yeah. Um, I keep telling my wife I'm going to retire. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it does seem to keep coming back at me. But you know, it, it uh, life's different now to working on the team, and I, I just love what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, it just keeps me going. Great to chat. Thank you. Listening to Pat, it's clear that he loves what he's doing. Always has done. I took so much from our chat. All of his technical analysis was fascinating, and I love the way he was so forthright about drivers. He's worked with the greats, so he knows what he's talking about. In fact, what Pat doesn't know about F1 surely isn't worth knowing. Pat, many thanks for your time, and I look forward to seeing you at a Grand Prix again soon. And please do let me know what you think of Pat's career and the opinions that he held during our chat, because I read all of your messages always looking for a new perspective. Which brings me on to last week's show, and we had a lot of feedback about Oscar Piastri. He was interesting, he was relaxed, and he was quick-witted, wasn't he? And when I asked him which driver he'd most like to be stuck in a lift with, Kid Clutch got in touch, and he was impressed with his answer. Probably someone that could fix the lift, was Oscar's reply, and Kid said, This guy is so quick, so sharp, and humorous. Yes, he is, Kid, and thank you very much for getting in touch. Well, that's almost it for this week's show. If you still want more F1, why not check out F1 Nation's review of the Australian Grand Prix, which I recorded with a cast of Aussies in the Albert Park paddock after the race. And it's out now, as is the latest episode of F1 Explains. And if you want F1 tech, there are weekly articles on F1.com for you, as well as F1 TV's Tech Talk, where all the latest car upgrades are analysed. Thanks for listening and see you next week when I'll be back with another great guest from Formula One. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.